Welcome to the long green season. This is the first Sunday of what we call ordinary time, which is a bit of a misnomer. This is the time when our gospel stories shift from crucial events in the life of Jesus, his birth, betrayal and death and resurrection, to his work and his teaching. This is the season when we are learning directly from Jesus what it means to follow him. Today, he sends his disciples out with no particular destination to proclaim the good news of God's kingdom. In the church of my childhood, a missionary was someone who traveled to a distant benighted land to bring the light of the gospel to its inhabitants. Those missionaries brought the Bible with a frequently served side dish of Western culture. The classic example is the missionaries who first went to Hawaii, where they were startled to find people who didn't wear very many clothes. The missionaries spent great energy getting their new converts into uncomfortable, extremely hot, head-to-toe clothing. What this had to do with the good news was unclear at best and represented the worst excesses of colonialism. And, of course, it's deeply ironic that hundreds of years later, people from our Western culture go to Hawaii to take off their clothes and rest on a sunny beach. In today's gospel, Jesus sends his disciples to share the good news. And we should stop here and identify what he means by good news. In my childhood church, when we talked about the good news, we meant this. Everyone is a sinner and God sent Jesus to die in our place so we can go to heaven. And corollary to this gospel, we were also taught that the Bible was inerrant and inspired and that we could ruin everything for ourselves by engaging in behaviors like dancing and drinking. Jesus says nothing about any of that. He never says in this gospel that the good news is about his death or about believing that he's the son of God. Instead, he says it's the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven that has come near. When he sends his disciples, that's the good news he tells them to share, and he tells them to demonstrate it by doing what he has been doing. The 19th century missionary model is out, but the church has frequently replaced it with a slightly different take on mission. Get people to church, where they will hear a religious professional tell them how to be religious. And Episcopalians have been traditionally quite bad at this because we haven't been saddled with the obligation to get people to heaven. But here in this moment, with the world completely upended, we're confronted with the reality that the church hasn't been able to worship together in some time. If that's our only venue to do what Jesus tells his disciples to do in this gospel, we have failed. But of course, I don't believe that. The first disciples had no church building, no youth group, no adult education. They had Jesus and his proclamation of God's alternative to the powers of the world. And they watched him demonstrate God's agenda over and over. He healed. He made abundance out of not enough. He drew people toward the center from lives of exclusion. He confronted evil with world-shattering love. He had compassion for those who were like sheep without a shepherd, and he pushed his friends to do the same. Francis of Assisi took this gospel to heart. He gave away everything he had. He went barefoot, summer and winter. When he died, his only possession was his much-repaired tunic. His rough living didn't serve him well, he was in his 30s when he died, having lived most of his adult life with chronic illness. So perhaps his isn't the best model for us. But here's what he did that we should pay attention to. Simply by deciding that the most important thing in life was to love as Jesus loved, he managed both to anger the church and to transform it. He chose a life so simple that he had nothing to lose. In our current situation, we could spend all of our time and energy trying to recover 
the church and the society that existed before COVID-19. Or we can choose to ask again with renewed interest what it means to be followers of Jesus and realize that the work Jesus gave his friends to do is work we can do right now. We have nothing to lose. A hymn from the Church of My Childhood that I still love goes like this. I love to tell the story, t'will be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. It's our task in this roller coaster reality to find new ways to know and to tell the old, old story. Unlike the missionaries who operated under the assumption that they had salvation to share and they had nothing to receive, we're invited by today's gospel to vulnerability, to relationship, to meet the people around us without concern for position or power, but instead to meet them with open minds, open hearts, open hands, and genuine concern for their thriving. We're invited to an attitude of the loving discovery of other lives, of meeting fellow pilgrims on the journey. Read Jesus' instructions about how his friends were meant to prepare for their missionary journey. Take nothing with you, he says. No extra clothes, no weapon, no food. This sounds like spectacularly bad advice. But Jesus is telling them to move toward others, to need others, to listen to others, to learn from others. I would add, he's asking them to remove themselves, to remove ourselves from the center of every encounter. Obliterate the lines that are erected by power to divide them from us. In the kingdom of God, there is only us. And that's not to say that our differences don't matter. Quite the contrary. We are each and all valued by God as bearers of the divine image. Eight billion of us on earth currently, each with a unique shard of divine light. Our stories matter, our culture matters, our language matters, our color matters. All of those things are part and parcel of who we are and how we bear the divine image or choose not to. We have learned in this challenging time a renewed appreciation for the fact that we need each other. We've been reminded again that we're called to value justice for each other. We've remembered because of its absence the joy of singing together. We are made tender and vulnerable by our sense of dis-ease and loss, and this puts us squarely in the best spot to do what Jesus asked his disciples to do, to go, to proclaim the alternative kingdom of God's values, to love. When it comes right down to it, What we have that's worth sharing is a vision of God's kingdom, even as we do not yet perfectly embody it. Our vulnerability and our need for one another and God's love and justice. Look again at what Jesus told his disciples to do. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. We can regard these as first century commands that have nothing to do with us, or we can look at them as commandments for us. And I've never successfully healed anyone, but I can pay attention to health. I can wear a mask and wash my hands. I can hand out sanitizer at Sunday supper. I can use my vote to uphold health care for all of us. I can work for the healing of the planet that sustains us. I can pray and work for the health of our nation and our society. 
I for sure cannot raise the dead. But I can refuse to give up hope for a healed planet and for a society that more closely resembles God's kingdom. I can maintain my faith in God's agenda of new life. And I can identify what things in me need to die in order for resurrection to make me anew. I don't know any lepers, but I know plenty of people who are pushed to the margins and branded with suspicion, as lepers were. I can learn their stories, and I can work to dismantle the systems that refuse to help. I can't cast out demons, but I can see and name and stand against evil. I can stand against the powers that work constantly to separate us into warring tribes, the powers that place profits above human thriving, the powers that assure us that people who have no running water somehow deserve their fate, the powers that delight in war and its weapons, the powers that promote the desecration of our planet, the powers that are the opposite of love. You may resist the idea that the way we live our lives can help or hurt anything, do damage or bring new life. You may think that faith is a private matter with no implications for our common life. You may think that mission is an old-fashioned idea that's so outmoded not to even be paid attention to any longer. Why then? Did Jesus send his friends to do the work of the kingdom? Was that a one-time thing? Well, we assert in our baptismal covenant that this is our work to do. We promise to pray, to resist evil, to proclaim good news, to seek and serve Christ in everyone, to love our neighbors, to respect the dignity of every human being, to strive for justice and peace. Our church, fusty and hidebound as it can be, holds at its core this burning sense of mission, not to conquer the world for Jesus, but to move among our fellow humans with love as our only agenda. To see behind the present moment and glimpse the world as God dreams it can be. I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Amen.